My name is Ron Robinson, and I have the privilege of being the chairman of the board of the World War II History Roundtable, Audie Murphy Chapter. I want to welcome all of you to a full house, a house that's more than full. Our theater, which is next door, has about 20 people in it or so, and they're going to be watching it on a movie screen. So, Don, you fill the house, and then you fill the nether house. So, congratulations to the board. What I would like to do, we have a little special thing that's going to happen right now, and uh, I want to introduce to you Susan Lanning. She is the director of the Audie Murphy American Pop Museum, and uh, tonight you all got a little brochure with a number, and there's going to be, uh, I'm going to give her a number, I, I, between 1 and 100, right? 95, between 1 and 95, and then whoever has that, it's going to win, dear Bob. Bob hopes wartime correspondence with the GIs of World War II. The lady that wrote that book was here this spring yes. for audio games, right? So anyway, it has a connection to the museum. All right, do you want to say anything, Sue? Yeah, I was just going to say, the book, um, Martha, she actually worked for Bob Hope for 12 years. So it was really cool listening to her story. So whoever wins this, I think will be really happy. And I also want to thank all of you for coming. If you've never been out to the museum before, definitely afterwards, the screen will go back up. Take a look around before you leave and come back. We also have newsletters in the back that you can pick up on your way out. And we have stuff going on every month. So we're always constantly having activities and events um, to, to, that people can come to. So, what number do you want? 41. All right. Oh, I'm sure you know this. 41. 41. Right. Oh. 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 Look out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I hope you do see that. We're going to have to get another book. <laughs> Show you, sure. you sure it's not 14? <laughs> 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 Can you turn it up? Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. 42 right there. 42 is right there. Right there. Right there. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Susan. Um, the round table was founded in an effort to memorialize the efforts and sacrifices of those men and women who served in World War II and successfully defeated the forces of tyranny. Our motto, printed in your program, says it all. They fought to save our nation's freedom. The glory is theirs, the duty to tell their story is ours. Our charter gold sponsor for tonight's program is the History Department at Texas A&M University. Charter gold sponsors support the costs of bringing our speakers to Greenville. If your company or organization has an interest in becoming a charter gold sponsor, please see me after the program. Our special thanks to the Audi Murphy American Cotton Museum for hosting our roundtable lectures. Staff members Kristen Still and Susan Lanning have been invaluable with their support. Other roundtable volunteers this evening include Kristen White and David Kane, who greeted you upon arrival. Matt Middleton also is our videographer of the program, which will be up on YouTube within a week or so of this program, so you can watch the entire program again and send it on to your friends. And co-chair, of uh, the Programs Committee of the Roundtable is John Scruggs, who's sitting back behind here, and he's the audio engineer for this whole project. So the sound is his responsibility. At the conclusion of tonight's lecture, the screen behind me will be lifted, and attendees are welcome to tour the audio Murphy portion of the museum. Following Don's program, he will be happy to answer any of your questions a microphone will be brought to you. Please wait until Kristen White brings it to you. Uh, and Kristen White was one of the people in the back who greeted with you when you came in. Uh, before you ask the question, why? Because we want to capture that question 
on videotape, so it'll be up on YouTube. Uh, Don will also pose for pictures behind the podium after the program is over. By the way, if you renew or become a charter member tonight, all books in the bookstore will be 20% off. Plus, the museum will extend a complimentary one-year individual membership to you. Should you wish to make a cash donation to the roundtable for tonight's lecture, you may do so at the cash register at the, or at the donations box, which is located near the cash register. On your seat were several pieces of paper. If you haven't already, please take a moment to either read or complete as requested with the pen or pencil that we provided. And after the lecture, leave them on your seat or turn them in at the cash register. Your information, your feedback to us will help us plan the 2025 lecture series. Please mark your calendar for October 24th when patents rise to glory. A lecture by Stephen Moore will be presented. Same location, same time. Moore is a prolific author of 12 history books, mostly about Texas and World War II military history. He has been a regular panelist at Fredericksburg's Nimitz Museum of the Pacific War annual symposium and is a contributing writer to the Dallas of the Dallas Morning News. Um, I want to tell you how I met Don Brooks. <coughs> Since 1997, I've worked at Texas Motor Speedway north of Fort Worth and have the privilege of managing three or four executive suites there during race weekends. And uh, last year there was a gentleman came uh, to the Speedway and he sang. And he said, he sang, God bless America. And that happens quite often, or not, not quite often, but it happens. Well, this year, the same gentleman came back, sang again, and he sings a cappella. And he turns out to be Don Graves. And I met him up in the suite. He came up in the suite afterward. And I said to Don, I told him who I was, and I said, uh, uh, sure hope you can come to Greenville and visit with us. He knew of Audie Murphy, and he said he would be happy to do so. Um, now, Don has with him this evening a very special individual that I want to introduce to you, because she's going to MC essentially, this entire program. And Don is going to be seated um, for the presentation. Uh, for his remarks. Uh, I want to introduce to you Senior Master Sergeant, retired, United States Air Force, Mary Stapel. And Mary, would you stand up? And she is the president. <laughs> and she is the president of Roll Call Organization in Fort Worth. And she may tell you more about it. But the long and the short of it is an organization that has a luncheon monthly, plus a whole bunch of other things they do for veterans. And they will attract 400 to 450 veterans to a lunch every month in Fort Worth, and they're free, and that there's no cost to the veterans. So without further ado, let me introduce Mary Stapel, and she will introduce Don, and we'll go from there. And you have Don's bio in your program, by the way, so we don't have to say much more about that. Okay, there's that. Thank you for having us today. Um, I think you're going to be uh, quite happy with you, Don. He's, he's quite the character. I've known him since I joined Roll Call in 2017. I've, I've heard about the organization, went to visit one of the World War II veterans, and next month I went to a board meeting, the next month I was a secretary, and a few years later, vice president and then president. So I've been doing this gig about four years as the president of Roll Call. Don it has been a member of Roll Call almost since the beginning in 2014. So Roll Call started with one man and a vision of bringing World War II veterans together 
to enjoy a meal and share stories and he started with 15 and today we have over 1700 members mm -hmm. nobody pays a penny to be a part of roll call anybody can join roll call uh, and the luncheons are free for the veterans we just ask the non-vets to pay the ten dollar cost of the meal which is what it costs us for the meal so when we ask for donations or when people invite down out to speak and they do donations every ten dollars donated to roll call feeds a veteran so we spend about five thousand to six thousand dollars a month putting on a luncheon so that's we don't have to earn, to raise a lot of money but every ten dollars goes a long long way so if you ever feel compelled to, to donate to an organization, look us up, Roll Call of North Texas. So my friend Don, he is, uh, I've been taking Don to speak and sing all over, all, all over a lot of places, not even just here in the DFW area, but we've gone to, oh, they can hear me, Don, this thing's plenty loud. He's worried you guys can't hear me. You can hear me back there, right? Okay. Um, so Don goes out and speaks and he tells his story anywhere that he's invited and then he will of course like to close I'm sure with God bless America right so Don is uh, gonna usually he'll stand to do this but tonight he's having a little trouble with his leg so we're gonna have him sit down so that he doesn't have to push that leg too much Don turned 99 in May <laughs> birthday party so it should be a big shindig um, and uh, and we're looking forward to that so Don will be singing at the Rangers game on the 4th for military day he'll be singing the national anthem uh, he'll be singing again at the Motor Speedway he just is everywhere singing Rangers you got the Rangers coming up Cowboys you did that once I think but so Don is out at least four or five times a month speaking, singing, whatever he's invited to do. And as, as you see in his biography, Don is one of those survivors from the Battle of Iwo Jima. And he's going to tell you the story. He is having a little trouble with his hearing aid, so I'm going to kind of ask him. And when you ask him questions, I'll be whispering in his ear to make sure that he can hear you. Cool? And if you can't hear something, let us know and we'll fix it for you. Don, you ready to come up here and share your story? Good. All right, hang on a second. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. He always picks on me because I outrank him. <laughs> traveled all over the place. So Don, let me find the first slide. Let's start before that slide. Can you tell everybody here, where were you when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor and what made uh, you join the Marines? Yeah. I was 16 years old. There were three of us in a car. It was an old Ford. We had a radio hooked up. And you know, we loved the big bands. You young people don't know what I'm talking about. But if you did, you'd want to have them back, I can tell you that. Good, popular music. No crazy stuff. No throwing one another all over the place. You held a woman in your arms. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> all right. We're sitting in the car and we're listening to music called Detroit. And we have a blanket around us, got a cap and jacket on. We're all three 16 years old. And on comes the announcer. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to interrupt this broadcast. The president of the United States is going to address the nation. We said, what's this all about? Now, this is the 8th of December, the day after Pearl Harbor. And the old man came on. And this is what he said, and I will never forget it. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy, United States of America was suddenly and deliberately 
attacked upon by the naval and armed forces of the Empire of Japan. I interpret the will of Congress and of the people. We shall gain triumphant victory, so help us God. Great speech, the greatest I ever heard. The old man, FDR, when we walked off of Iwo Jima, I'll tell you about that one. They boarded the Higgins. They took us out to our transport. After fighting for six, six and a half weeks, we crawled up the ladder and a Navy boy was up there to grab us and help us in. Well, that's the story on the end. That's, that's how I happened to fall in love with the Marine Corps. My dad was a Marine. And we all remember James Cag, Jimmy Cagney, Pat O'Brien. They, they always played sergeants in the Marine Corps. And I always saw those movies. I want to be a Marine. You know what I told my two buddies? I said, well, I'm skipping school tomorrow. I'm going down to the recruiting station. I'm going to join up in the Marine Corps. They said, you can't. You got to be 17. I said, I only got six months to go. Your mother's never going to sign that. I said, my dad will sign it. She'll sign it. No, she won't. Well, next morning comes up, and I told my two sisters and brother, don't say nothing to mom. I'm going downtown to join the Marine. I'm going to get the paper anyway. So they took off, and I ran all the way downtown, one mile. It was about 8 o'clock, and I walked up on the fourth floor and met a gunny sergeant in the doorway. He said, what can I do for you, young man? I said, I want to join up. He said, how old are you? I said, 16. He said, you, you can't do that. I can't take you. You've got to be 17 years old. Now, Audie Murphy cheated. He got in early. But it was the Army that he got into, and the Marine Corps would not tolerate it. So he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you the paper you need. You go home to your mother and father and tell them when you're 17, have them sign it, bring it down to me, and we'll, we'll, we'll do business. Do you want to do that? I said, yes, sir. He said, go. I ran home, ran all the way home. I was so excited, folks, I forgot I skipped school. I walked in the back door, and I showed her the paper. Oh, my gosh, I skipped school. She said, what are you doing home? And my mom was 11, 10 foot something, 10. Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, well, forget it. She was a little short Irish lady. And she said, what are you doing home? I told her, go back to school right now. I said, it's too late. They won't let me in now. OK, you're going to be doing some work around here. Take that paper and throw it away. I said, yes, ma'am. I ran to the dining room, opened the buffet drawer up, tucked it under some papers, shut the drawer, went outside. Well, six months passed by. I'm 17. It's my birthday, May 3rd. And my dad is there. I didn't have a good father, but he was there. And I went and got the paper, and I said, Dad, sign that. He said, what is it? I said, it's paperwork. I'm going to the Marine Corps. Give me a pen. <laughs> he signed it. He said, give this to your ma. I said, she won't sign it. He said, Vera, that was her name, come here. She walked over, signed this. The boy's going to the Marine Corps. She said, I'm not going to sign that paper. I went through this once before with you. I'm not going through this again. He said, Vera, listen to me. The boy walks out of school. He's been doing little odd jobs here and there. He'll probably turn out to be a bum, sign the paper. And I did this to my mother. She said, give me the pen. She took the pen, signed the paper. I ran all the way back down. And he said, good, now we can do business. Go home. I signed the papers. He said, go home. Tell your mother and father we'll call them in two weeks, take you down to the train station. We'll have a little ceremony. You'll head for San Diego Marine Corps base. I said, yes, sir. That was it. That's how I got in the Marine Corps. Right. Hey, Tom, didn't you have to go through a physical Pardon? Before? Yeah, I forgot to mention that. I'd rather, I wanted to skip it, actually. <laughs> now, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. 
See that door again? I said, yes, sir. You're going to go in that door and you're going to meet a Navy doctor. He's going to check you over from the top of your head to the tip of your toe, and you ain't never going to forget. You want to do that? I said, yes, sir. He said, go. I ran into the door, came out smiling. I said, I, I passed. I passed. Okay, go home. We'll give you a call. That was it. Right. So then you went off to boot camp. Right, you went to boot camp. Where did you go after boot camp? I went to San Diego Marine Corps Base. Now, what they do in 12 hours, we did in eight hours. Oh, gosh. I must be getting tired. What they do in 12 weeks, we did in eight weeks. That top soldier, Marine. He took us down the first morning to the, bay, to, to the boondocks where the water is, and there's docks there, and there's a couple of transports there. We got down there, and he, he said, at ease. I want you to all look at those two ships there. You see them? Yes, sir. He said, when I get through with you, after eight weeks, you'll join an outfit. And you'll train with that outfit, and that outfit's going to go aboard one of those transports. And if you keep your nose clean and do as you're told, you might just come back, but I doubt it very much. How do you like to have that at 17 years old told to? First trip away from home. First time we ever left home. Well, it all happened. To make a long story short, I went overseas. I was with an anti-tank battalion. My job was driving a Dodge pickup truck with a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun between the assistant driver and me. That's why I have hearing aids now. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah, so <clears throat> they broke us up. They couldn't use us because the half tracks that we had would burrow down in the, in the mud and the water. So we joined another outfit. A brand new one. This was Roosevelt's project. Roosevelt wanted I Iwo Jima in a worse way because they couldn't come back from B-29s with B-29s from Tokyo. They would go down in the drink. By taking Iwo Jima, getting it out of the way, they could come down if they had to, otherwise go right back to Saipan. And the P-51 had just come out and it could go there and go back. The other planes would run out of gas. They couldn't do it. That was the purpose of taking Iwo Jima. That was Roosevelt wanted. That's what he got. Did you want to say something? Uh, you were heading toward Iwo Jima. What? You were heading toward Iwo Jima, and you had a unique breakfast experience. To make a, uh, make a long story real short, we took off for Iwo Jima. First, I have to tell you, I was a flamethrower operator like Woody Williams. He was in the north. I was on the south where Mount Mar Suribachi was. We both did the same thing. Now, Woody stayed aboard ship for about three and four days. They didn't come in right away because he couldn't get any more Marines on the beach. We were elbow to elbow. We were crawling over one another. We couldn't put any more on the beach. That's three divisions. We had two divisions on there already. All right. So, Don, but tell them before you got to the beach, when they brought yeah. the clay, they brought the clay models out, and then what did they do? Hey, hey sir, sir, give me a break, will you? <laughs> she just loves to push the jar heads. I'm telling you, yeah. Well, we're aboard ship on the way to Iwo Jima. Two weeks from Saipan. One morning we both woke up. There is evil. Planes are fighting in the air. We had a free show. There it was. They were shelling the daylights out of it. Navy, everything. And they brought up breakfast. 
And guess what we had for breakfast that morning? Steak and eggs. Now listen, I had a lot of eggs, cold storage. But I never had a steak given to me by the Marine Corps. So I said to a kid next to me, hey, buddy, yeah, what's with the steak? He said, Graves, use your head. What do they do with convicts before they execute them? <laughs> Man your boats, your landing craft. All right. You were on the landing craft, and you approached the beach, and tell them about the experience you had on the beach. Uh, I don't know. It took us a couple hours. We rallied around, 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 and each battalion went in. Now, my battalion, we took Mount Suribachi on the south end by Mount Suribachi, and there's a bay in there. And that's where we went in. The 4th Division went over on Red Beach up towards that way. So we come in towards the beach, and I expected him to get us off on land. He couldn't get in the water because Marines were stacked up. Overboard. I got a 72-pound flamethrower on my little back. 72 pounds, five gallons of fuel. I have a man on my left and one on my right. They have to help me. They have to stay by me. When, we shot, when I shot fire in a hole or a foxhole or a pillbox, whatever you want to call it, and they come run out on fire, they would pick them off and kill them. Well, we, we, over the sides we went. I went down on the water. The boys got in with me. They picked me up. We dropped on the sand to my right. Above from here to that wall over there was John Bassalone. He was on a bond tour. His commander was Chesty Puller, who was a captain then. On Guadalcanal, he was a lieutenant. Now, John was on a bond tour. He came into his captain and he said, Skipper, he said, I can't do this anymore. He said, I want to be with my buddies. He said, John, we're making a lot of money through bond tours. He said, I, I really want to be with my buddies. And he said, John, you're a medal of honor. I can't say no. Go. He took off, joined our outfit, trained with us. We hit, he hit the beach with us. John was over there, and then all of a sudden, word spread. Barcelona just got it from a sniper up on Mount Suribachi, 545 feet away. That's how far it was from where we were. We had to get up on top, turn left, and take that mountain out of the way because it was firing all over eight square miles. It was just playing havoc with us. Well, I lay in the sand. Now, being of the greatest generation, we had nothing. We had overalls. That's what we wore. We lived in my grandma's cottage on a lake because they had a small farm. and They couldn't care for both, so my mother said, we'll take care of the cottage. You go ahead and you, have the, you use that for, for your living. It was wonderful. I spent a lot of my time on the lake fishing. I love fishing. This is in Detroit. Well, any time we had to go to a party or something, my mother would sponge press our clothes, try and do the best she could. We had tennis shoes. Not what you guys wear. I'm talking about tennis shoes, excuse me, that stink. <laughs> They're terrible. They always stink. We would not go to church. My mother said, any time you want to go to church, go. We wouldn't go. We were ashamed. We sort of hung around together, not with a lot of kids. Not too many kids had money. Detroit went through the, the Great Depression. We got knocked down. So that was the conditions. I, I never went to church. 
I lay on that beach, and the only thing I could think of was pray. Never prayed seriously in my life. I said, God, I don't know you, but if you can do for me what people say you can do, and you get me off this island, I'll serve you the rest of my life. He got me off the, got me off the island. Six weeks later, the battle was over. I went to occupation Japan three months. Got back, let out, went home, and just did what I wanted to do. Okay, now before you tell them about how after, let's talk a little more about the island. Who? Let's talk a little more about what happened on the island. On Iwo Jima. Huh? So when you got, after you got off the beach, how long did it take you to get from the beach to the top of Mount Suramati? Right. Let's go back to the beach. <laughs> when I got to the top of the beach, I was alone. I didn't have my buddies anymore. Do you know what the lifespan was of a flamethrower on Iwo Jima? Take a guess. How much, what would you say? How long? In between. How much? Four seconds. We lost every one of ours in the battalion. What did Williams experience the same way in his outfit? It was the grace of God that we came home. It had to be. 545 feet from the top of the beach to the base of Mount Suribachi. We all got to the top. We made a left turn. It took us three days to travel that distance. Three days. When we got to the base, they threw hand grenades down on us. Just, just let them roll, let them lob. We couldn't throw them back up. We had heavy casualties. Finally, we got it settled down a little bit, and we started going up, up the side of the mountain. When we got to the crest, I looked over, and I was stunned. They're raising a flag. And I wondered, what in the world? We didn't know anything about a flag. That was never in the job. Where'd they get the pole? Where'd they get, where'd they get everything? Well, here's how it happened. Lieutenant Schreier, that's in that picture you saw, Lieutenant Schreier was my battalion commander. He was his executive, though he called him. He said, Harold, see if you can get to the top up there. Take some boys with you. Take this flag. And he took it out of his chest. I got it from the ship's skipper. He wondered if I put it up for him. And that was the small flag. And Harold said, Aye, sir. He grabbed about six, seven fellows. They wandered around the left side. Now, it wasn't too bad that side because the ocean's there. And they finally got up on top. While we're fighting here, they have a skirmish and kill about six, seven Japanese, and they work on it. Now, here's what you don't know. When you look at the raising of the flag, that pole is drain pipe. They had drain pipe up there. The Japanese would capture and ca get all the water they could from the rain. They couldn't make their water. We made our water. Our boys made it down the beach. We were never short of water. Here's something else. For the first time, what was that in the arm? What'd they call that? They shoot it into you after you're wounded. Huh? Yes. We had it. They had nothing. Well, there we are. It's all settled. We turn around and look, and all blazes are going on in the north. We stayed there overnight. The next morning, we marched over to a village that wasn't there anymore because the artillery and the Navy leveled that ground. Everybody was killed. But we had a big get-together before we got to Hill 362A. I'll tell you about that one. 
we had a good skirmish where that village was. I don't know where they came from, but they came at us. 50% of those boys were women, their sweethearts or their wives. They couldn't get them off the land because they wouldn't give any planes to get them off. They had no air force anymore. They were in bad shape, the Japanese. All right, we turn to Hill 362A. You'll find it on any map of Iwo Jima. I know you've heard of it. That took our battalion. It was terrible. They came every hour of that big mouth with everything. The next morning, I had a buddy call me. He said, I want to see you on a ledge. We're going up there. So we crawled up on top of Mount Suramacha the next morning. We had a five-gallon can of gasoline. We had rope. We had everything we needed to set it off. And a cone-shaped demolition that would blow holes right in the ground. We set that can off, swung it on the rope, and then pulled it. And a kabooey and fire blew out of there. They just went to the north, underground. We, we didn't think there was any casualties at all. Well, we got down from there and headed to the north. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just about three things that happened. There was humor in combat. There was humor. We're sitting there one time in a, in a hole, three of us. Now, there was no fighting in the daytime. You just had to hunker down because the, shri- the snipers would get you. But at nighttime, they would have bonsai charges, about two, 300 of them. And we would wait for them. We'd kill them all. Few of us got wounded or killed. It was terrible. They'd come screaming, beating on everything they could make. They made blue horns, everything, to scare you. But you get used to it. At the other time, we're sitting in a hole, three of us, no squad, they're gone. We fought together. And I'm looking for snipers. So this is the ground, and I'm up there on the ground looking like this. You get careless. I couldn't see nothing. I was up there 15 minutes. I couldn't see anything moving. I got back down, got on my phone, called company CP, and I said, Graves to CP. Go ahead, Graves. And I told him, I said, I can't see anything. Nothing going on. Well, he said, I'll tell you, they know we're here because first sergeant took around his leg. He's down at the sick bay right now. Keep looking. By the way, you got a kid coming for a replacement. He'll be there in about 10 minutes. I good, we can use him. 10 minutes later, 15, he came to the edge of our hole and said, who's Graves? I said, I am. What do you want me to do? I said, sit down. There'll be a lot to do. Well, got to get up there, and I grabbed the glasses, and he said, Graves, let me have your glasses. I said, no, you get yourself shot. One of my buddies says, Give him the glasses. That's what he's here for. I threw him the glasses. I sat back down. We're talking. He's up there looking. And then all of a sudden, he fell back. His helmet fell off and spun next to my feet. When it stopped, we were stunned. When it stopped, I looked down in it like that. And there's a beautiful lady sitting in a chair. And on her lap was a baby. I lost it. I took everything off my back. I, I, I just, listen, I cursed the island. I cursed Iwo Jima. Folks, I cursed God. Having let that kid take my place. I never could understand how we who were not Christian maybe knew, heard about God, but not Christians. And we had Christian men from different denominations. And they were killed. But I'm alive. I couldn't understand that. I never could understand it, and I forgot my pledge on the beach. Now I'm going to go through this. Let's say the war is over on Iwo Jima. Hold on, you can't go there yet. You forgot to tell them. You said there's humor. There's humor oh, in war. Lord. You have to tell hot chocolate, and then you have to talk about the cemetery leaving the bay. Every time I ask anybody that's familiar with those stories, one girl will say, talk about the hot chocolate. <laughs> but 
Well, it's pretty well over, folks. They're not coming out now. They're running down the north end, and our boats pick them off so they don't run anymore. They stay where they're at. They're not bothering us, and we're not going to bother them. And I'm sitting there, and I said, I feel like hot chocolate. They said, we'll make enough for three of us. Now, in combat, you get a D-bar ration, and it's bittersweet chocolate. So we chipped in our three bars. And I diced them all up my K-bar, poured water in there, stirred it all the best I could. I got it all ready. And we're talking and shooting the breeze. Then all of a sudden, I said, smell that chocolate? Yeah, is it ready? I just about. Then all of a sudden, I heard, hey, Marine, very good chocolato. You bring chocolato here. I said, if you want chocolate, you come and get it. He says, oh, no, you bring here. <laughs> what about to come and get it? So then, Don, the battle's over. Uh -huh. The battle's over. And you're heading to leave. You're getting ready to leave the beach. What did you do at the cemetery? Oh, yes. Another sad thing in my life. I think of it all the time. There were eight of us, 18 of us left in my company, or our battalion. I don't know what it was throughout the other two divisions. We got word we're going to be released by the third division, Woody's division. So they released us. 18 of us walked down out of 300. We came down by, the, by our 5th Marine Division Seminary, which is at the foot of Mount Surabachi. They're gone now. They asked if they could, if they, we would remove the cemeteries. We did it. We moved, we, we moved it. The families came and got exhumed bodies or we'd move them. Well, I met, we met our regimental commander. My battalion commander was killed. And he said, Ben, I want every one of you, this is the whole division, Walk through that cemetery. I want you to say goodbye to your buddies and your officers. Come back out. We'll form formation. We'll go in a Higgins boat, and we'll go aboard our transport. We'll head back to New Mia, Hawaii, and we're going to get ready for Japan. Uh, I'm sorry. Get, get ready. Yeah, get ready for Japan. They hadn't surrendered yet. Germany surrendered. We went back. Well, wait a minute. As we went in the cemetery, I noticed every time someone walked through the gate of the cemetery, on the left side of the arch was a, a paper, eight and a half by 11, just like you're holding. And something was written on it. I think a CB did it. They're good for that stuff. When I got there, this is what I read. And this includes everyone in this room and outside, and everywhere else. Fellas, when you go home, tell the folks we did our best, that they may have many more tomorrows. Not one dry eye walked through that cemetery. When we came out, we saw our buddies, we saw our officers, the crosses. We came out, got aboard ship, went back. And then shortly after that, occupation, the war ended. Iwo Jima was considered the worst battle in the Pacific. Some of them say it's the worst battle in the history of the Marine Corps. I think there's one other battle that you folks are familiar with that is compared to it. It's already been recorded. I'll help you all. The battle was in Philadelphia. What? What? Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Gettysburg was as bloody a battle as Iwo Jima. Terrible. So, Don, after the war, you went home. What did you do? Bubbed around. Besides that, what did you do? Yeah. I went to work in the plants, auto industry. Hated to be cooped up. 
walked out. My brother the same way. And we had we had a little money come in from the VA. We used that up. Well, then I thought, no, you've got to get a job done. You're not going to make it this way. So I went to work for an Ash Kelvin Theater. I met a little gal. We got married. We were married for about, oh, close to a year. This is interesting. I'll never forget it. We're in an apartment, and we're not getting along. We were talking about splitting up. I was losing some of my best friends. I was a singer. I met a lot of people, and I was losing some. I went up on a fishing trip, north, northern Wisconsin. We're in Wisconsin now. We lived there 32 years, and after we raised four children. Well, I didn't catch any fish, but the bottle bass were budding. You know what I'm saying? I came home, threw myself on the couch. My wife is doing her chores, housework. Phone rang. My wife answered it. She said, I'll go get him. She said, Don, Mr. Vila wants to talk to you. Now, there was a gentleman from Denmark, Copenhagen, a wonderful old dame, godly man. We, he was our landlord once. He would do anything for us. I respected him. I said, Mr. Vila. He said, Don, I want to talk to you. And I don't want you to say one word. I said, yes, sir. You are a mess. I didn't deny that. You're losing your best friends. You're going to lose your wife. And you're going to lose yourself. And you can't do anything about it. Not the way you are. Would you take my wife and I to a Billy Graham program? By way of screen, uh, by way of a scr moving screen, at Ashkod, which is 16 miles up the lake. You know what I said? I'll change clothes and be right over. Someone is beginning to do something. We walked in that auditorium. Someone said it was 2,700 people, and they knew me because of my singing. I was a mess. My wife and I walked with this couple. We sat down in the front row, my wife next to me. The movie came on, Billy. And this is what he said. You were not your own, you bought for the price. And that price was Jesus Christ on Calvary. What are you going to do with Christ in your life? You need God, you need him tonight. And you need to come. You need him tonight. You come. Your life will be changed. You know you've been a fraud. You know. You've been against God Almighty. It's time you come. I swore, folks, he knew about me, and he was talking to me. That's what I thought. They started singing an invitation song. Belly was over with. And I listened to that song. Then something hit me. You hypocrite. You liar, you use God. You use God for your own gain, and he, he kept his word. He got you out of battle. You went through it. You came out alive. Look at what you've been doing. I dropped on the floor, and I cried like a baby. I was a mess. I got up on my feet. And the speaker said, now we've sang this song once. We're going to do it twice. We'll be through. We'll send you home. But if you have a desire to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll help you. Come up. We'll give you a Bible. Send you home. I said, if they do, I'll go up. They started singing, and I stood up. I didn't know, the rest, I didn't know what my wife was doing. And a voice said to me, I don't believe in any hocus-pocus stuff. This voice was real. 
It said to me, sit down, you fool. What about your wife? And I said, I don't think this is going to work. I turned around and looked at my wife. She looked at me and she got up, walked over, took my hand and said, let's both go up. We both walked up to the preachers, gave us a Bible, prayed for us. I felt like a new creature. I fell in love with God. I knew that I was relieved that he didn't hold that against me anymore. We went home, dropped the couple off. We sat in a love chair. It isn't a love chair. It's It's a big brown leather chair that was a wedding gift. We never sat together on that chair. And we automatically sat in that chair. And I said, you know, I, we've got an old Bible somewhere. And I looked down at the table, and here it was, an old Bible. I picked it up, I put it on my lap, and I flipped it open. And I said, I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to put my finger on something. And I went like that. And she said, what does it say? And I said, listen, the Lord is good, a strong in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Nahum 1, 7. God trained me for seven years. He drilled me in scripture. He sent me to Moody Bible Institute. And Moody Bible Institute professor said to me, he said, Don, I'm going to be honest with you. I believe you're sincere in what you've experienced. You need theology. And we've got the material for you. Are you willing to study that? Are you willing to complete it? And we'll give you a certificate and a license. I said, yes, sir. He said, go to the library, tell them what you want. I did. I took it home. They didn't want me in the classroom because they thought I caused trouble. (laughs) Me caused trouble? That's not possible. Well, I went home. Three of us, two boys took me. I studied and I studied and I worked for you for Christ. And then I was getting my upper 40s then. And the and the boss said, Don, do you ever consider going speaking in churches? I said, I like this. He says, listen, the kids are beginning to call you dad for crying out loud. He said, you're working with youth. (laughs) I said, golly, is it am I that old? Yeah, I said, you're that old. (laughs) I said, okay, I'll go. I went home, and I began to speak part-time in churches. It got so busy that God allowed someone to send me an invitation letter to come to a church. This is all in Wisconsin. And I went to a country church that had an average of 250 people. It's down to 35. They lost their young people. The preacher there tore the place apart. I never had a, ch- I've never did that in my life. And I, they said, go home, think about it, and give us a call. I went home. She said, what did you say? How, how did you do? I said, honey, I can't, I don't think I can handle it. Don, you can handle that. You love that. Do it. So I called them up and said, I'm interested in visiting again. They had me come again. They had me preach. Everything seemed to go good. And they wanted to know if I would especially work getting young people back in the church. I got almost all the kids back in. We increased from 35 to 275 people in the church. We were known as the singing church. And the grace of God did it, not me, but he allowed me to be the steward, the servant. And I had five churches. And I love the Lord. And I'll never forget him. And I'll die if it takes. He did something for me I will never forget. He can do the same for anyone here that's without Christ today. I'm telling you, it works. It never fails. Well, what do you say? So, Don, Um, before we go to question and answer, before we do question and answer, would you sing God bless America? You know, you the, know first the first time, time I ever sang, sang it, it, I forgot, I forgot this. this. Thank, Thank you. you. The, the first, first time I ever heard God Bless America was over a Jeep radio. Kate Smith. Remember Kate Smith? The big lady. 
She made that song famous. She had that song printed. And he, she put the title, God Bless America. I heard her on her radio program give the grand opener of that song. People went crazy. The, the, uh, the, the stores were selling copies of it like crazy. I learned it. I love it. I sing it all the time. How many of you know God Bless America? There you are. Some of you old timers. <laughs> well, guess what? You're going to sing it tonight. I'm going to stand, and if you want to stand, that's fine. You don't have to, but it is, it is our second patriotic song. Incidentally, I'm ticked off when I saw that bonfire of our flag today. I'm ticked off. I'm going to talk to Trump about that. All right, now, you're going to sing. Here we go. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountain, to the prairie, to the ocean, why we form, God bless America, my home sweet home, God bless America. My home, sweet home. Okay. Thank you. They're, they're going to do questions and answers. Huh? They're going to do oh, all right. And answers. Listen, Sit should down. we ask your questions? Yeah. Are there any questions? Sit down. Anything at all? Yes, sir. Take, Take the, the mic. mic. Yeah. yeah. First of all, I'd really like to say thank you. I've really enjoyed your uh, speech tonight because it brought me back to 1952. The same thing happened to me, and I joined the Marine Corps. And when you talked about General Chesty Poor, we were getting ready to ship over, and Chesty Poor was on the balcony over in Pendleton and he said the boys are getting ready to go and some of them boys are 17 and 18 and they never had a drink and they never knew what it was to get drunk but I want them to know this before they ship out Tuesday so all the Coke machines are gone, and the booze machines are in. <laughs> that was General Chesty Fuller back in 1952. All right. All right. Thank you. My wife and I just, uh, I live in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. My wife and I just uh, built a Woody Williams Gold Star Monument in Owasso, and Woody's grandson, he's head of it now, Chad, the grandson, and we had a dedication Memorial Day. We had about 300 people come out, and about five years ago, six years ago, I brought John Bassalone's niece here to do, uh, we did a program here, and she's the head of the foundation of the John Bassalone. Did you know Chuck Lindbergh and Woody? Uh, did you know him personally? He knew Woody. What was the other one? Chuck Lindbergh. There's a picture of him going up South Mare, yeah. South Mount Chuck Sarah Bunching. Chuck Lindbergh. Did you know him? There was a picture of him going up uh, South Mount Sarah Bunching with a flamethrower. He was on Sarah Bunching? Yeah. He was on there. Say the name again. Chuck Lindbergh. Yes, I know. I, I, he sent me a picture. Yeah. Okay. I knew Lindbergh. I knew all of those guys. Ira Any Hayes chance, was my buddy. Any chance of getting y'all to come to Oklahoma 
Yeah. 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 I'm Jimmy Hummison from Lake Jackson, Texas, fellow Marine. Good to see you again. I wanted to ask you, did you know Chuck Tatum? Chuck wrote the book, I believe it was uh, Black, uh, Red Blood, Black Sand on Iwo Jima. Chuck Tatum? Chuck what? Tatum. You, you don't know where he fought or you know his outfit? Yeah, Chuck wrote the book. I believe it's called Black Sand. Red Blood or Red Blood Black Sand. It was about Iwo Jima. He was in the platoon with John Bassalone and he. Well, then he was on the beach with us. Yes, sir. And uh, he put together a video before DVDs. He put together a video on the life of John Bassalone. And um, he was a friend with uh, Paul Merriman. Paul was with the 3rd Marine Division uh, from Houston. And um, anyway, he wrote a book. I don't know if you recall him personally or not, but he was also an advisor for Steven Spielberg on the the movie The Pacific. Anyway, did, did you say Bill Burr? Um, not Billy Burr. Huh? John Tatum. Chuck Tatum. Chuck. Sorry, Chuck Tatum. Chuck Tatum. He lived in Cal Northern California. He died about ten years ago. But anyway, I just wanted to ask you that. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're talking a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to mention this for this fellow Marine over here on, on my left, um, to another uh, fellow Marine who respects uh, General Lewis B. Chesty Puller. I do own the flag, very fortunate to own the flag that draped his casket. In Saluda, Virginia, in October. See, if you tell me, if you tell me where he was on the island, I can I can tell you what outfit he was in. Yeah, the name, the 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 uh, the unit. Like Jasper, John Basilo was was in my battalion. I see it. You must have been in the same battalion. But in reference to this Marine to my left, chest. General uh, Bush Casket in October of 71. And um, the flags, just like on Iwo Jima, the flags got a little mixed up. And the flag in the uh, Salute of Virginia um, Museum, which is two blocks from Chesty's house, has the flag that draped his body from Hampton Roads Naval Hospital to the Salute of Virginia funeral home. Yeah. And a friend of mine who's still living, who's 91, sold me the flag for a lot of money and it will wind up in one of the marine museums when I'm gone. But anyway, good. thanks for coming, Don, and we appreciate your stories and your, your service. Thank you. Semper Fi, brother. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. <laughs> I'm sorry to put your mind to such a test in such a time by name. Oh, that might right up your... Well, in any case, I was raised in an orphanage for 10 years. I can't hear it. I was raised in an orphanage for 10 years. One of the he's got to fit when he's on the side. Don't talk on the side. Oh, he puts a button. Is that any better? There you go. Okay. Well, I was raised in an orphanage for 10 years. The man in charge of that orphanage was a Marine, an officer, 
on Iwo Jima, and he was in command of a flamethrower outfit. I don't know when or what the name of, but his name himself was Donald A. Mott, M-O-T-T. -T. He was a flamethrower commander. You know, every every company has two flamethrowers. We understand, but like I say, I just since you were there and you were a flamethrower, and I remembered him being one. I thought I'd ask if you, by chance, ran across him in training or something. But thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Simple five. Simple five. That beard's not regulation. No. <laughs> I'm undercover. <laughs> I actually played Santa Claus for the uh, Toys for Tots for the Marine Corps. So. <laughs> Don't tell kids. <laughs> I'm lying. Oh. Santa's a boy. <laughs> um, I, I actually have a question. How do you feel, and this can go out to pretty much all the old timers, how do you feel when you hear Japan trying to change the names and do away with some of the things from World War II, such as Iwo Jima, you know, they changed that name to Iwato. And they tried to change the name of Wake Island as well, and some of the other islands, to erase the history of World War II. How do you feel about them changing the name of the island? Like, you know, the names of the islands that they, the Japanese are changing, how do you feel about them? What was the other? They're changing the names, like Iwo Jima, they're changing it to a different name. How do you feel about that? I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that question. Yeah. I don't think he's ever considered it or even thought about it. Well, I just spent, I was <laughs> in... I don't, that we've talked about. I was in Iwo Kuni for eight years teaching for the Department of Defense, and Iwo Kuni was where they planned Pearl Harbor. And Japan, every year they wanted to tear down Building 1, which is the actual planning stage. And then they changed all the, uh, almost all the islands. You know, they're trying to get rid of it, and they're saying that it wasn't them, it was the Japanese Army. You can't do that back there. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. I've noticed uh, a lack of patriotism in our country. And uh, I'd like to, for you to express how it felt to come home to a victorious nation and, and how you guys felt when you uh, come home to receive that kind of a welcome. Patriotism today is not here anymore. As you well know, and so he wants to know how did it feel to come home to the patriotism you came home to? You know, I think we have to understand that when we leave, we're kids. Now we come back, we're 19 years old. Things don't remain the same. It's never the same. You know, I want to go back and I want to see my friends and I want to do this. It's not, it's not going to happen. Things change. It's never going to happen. So I wasn't too happy when I got home. But what about the difference in the patriotism? In the when one you, I can't hear you. Patriotism. Huh? Patriotism. When you came home, the, the fanfare, everybody was excited. They were happy you were home. And today people are burning flags. How does that make you feel? Now I understand your question. How much time do we have? <laughs> I am ticked off. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. How many are with me? I'm ticked off. Right. I don't like what I said done to my flag. Nope. What's going to happen to these kids in school where they're told it's right to respect the flag? What are they thinking? Yeah, but those people kicked it around. They set it afire. And who's running the country? Nobody. Our country is going to the dogs. Our country was wrecked the first day Biden walked in office. He destroyed our country. 
I, I have answers, but nothing's going to be done about it. The only thing I, I, I you know, I, I just can't understand where these people come from that do that. All of our veterans shed blood. The very man that gave the name here, he shed some blood. All of us have fought in war after war after war to save this country, to build it what it should be, it was, and isn't anymore. I don't know what to, listen folks, let me tell you something. Anybody my age, this isn't my country. This is not the country I was brought up in. What happened to it? Where did it go? Look at our schools. We've got teachers that want to teach right, and they're fired or they quit. We allowed this poison to get into our schools. Our politicians allowed it to happen. They did nothing about it. And the Supreme Court didn't do anything about it. Well, when that happens, folks, we're pretty helpless, I'll tell you that. But I, I see America coming to something. And it's a word we haven't for, heard for a long time. Good old-fashioned American Revolution. The American people need to rise up, take a hold of things, become a republic again, and tell them what to do. Then if we're paying them, we should be able to. I hope I didn't speak out of order. So, <laughs> preach it, brother. Preach it. <laughs> All right. One more we got. Well, my name is Wendell Wallace. I'm ex Army and Navy Vietnam. Born here in Greenville. I have a question for you. How many times have you been back to Iwo Jima since you left the first time? Have you ever been back? I went back once, eight years after. I was totally disappointed. But one funny thing happened. The, the island is covered with shrubbery and weeds and green. You can't see where we fought or anything. But if you go up Mount Suribachi, and incidentally, we drove up this time. <laughs> and I'm sitting like this. Going up. <laughs> we got up there on the very top of South Sarabat, and there's a con how many been there? Well, you know what I'm talking about. There's a grand concrete slab. Two flagpoles are there. One's Japanese, one is meant for us. Behind that is a memorial given to my battalion. The CBs made it. It's beautiful. Ooh. I thought she was going to tell me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I looked at those two poles. No flag on the right one. We had a lady along. Some of you remember. <coughs> uh, Tom, oh boy, I forgot his name. He was mayor. Tom Lepper. Remember Tom Lepper? Mayor of Dallas. Well, his wife, born daughters of World War II, and she took, she, she, she acquired a lot of money. So she took some of us back to Evil. And we were up on top, and Laura has a big satchel bag. And I looked and I said, all the fighting we did up here, all the blood that was shed, and we <coughs> lost the flag. I guess we'll have to take it again, eh, fellas? They said, who? I said, you. We ain't gonna do it. Laura said, not to worry, fellas. Reached in her bag, pulled out a six-foot flag. And we all held that flag up. And the, the marine photographers came up on top and took pictures of it. And I'll just bet you it said, Marines, raise flag again, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no more questions. All right. You made a good group. Thanks for having us.
This video has been brought to you by Juice. Juice is your community-owned provider for electric, internet, cable TV, and true local programming.